All right, welcome to the March 6th meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Our first meeting of the year, hooray. Uh, and our agenda tonight focused on um, hearing from four proposals of the nine that have been presented for this round. Uh, those four in the order as the agenda was will be the uh, Habitat for Humanity project on Woodland Drive, the Affordable Housing Monitoring Project, Invasive Plant Control at Lathrop Community, and Parsons and Shepherd House at Historic Northampton. Before we get to those, we have just a few quick items of business. Number one, as we always do before CPC meetings, if there's anyone out there who wishes to comment on anything having to do with the CPC, uh, now's the time to do so. Uh, if you could raise your hand virtually or literally, or make that known to Sarah. Any general public comment out there, Sarah, that you can see? I, I see no hands. No hands. Okay, moving right along, we have one set of minutes to approve. Sarah sent that to us yesterday or maybe a few days ago. That's minutes of October. 18th, 2023, when we are deliberating for projects in round one. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? Uh, Julia, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Chris. Any discussion on the minutes of October the 18th, 2023? No, we are good to go, sounds like. None, so uh, quick roll call since we are remote. Uh, Julia? Yes. Uh, Chris Hellman? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Lemmy? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Chris Tate? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. And as always, thank you, Sarah, for putting those minutes together. And we look forward to others coming down the pipe. Um, chair's report, the only thing I can comment on, and it's sort of peripheral to CPC, but has to do with the Historic Commission and Martha uh, is, is part of this. Um, the whole issue with church windows, I thought was an interesting one to say the least. And it certainly does have some ramifications in the past and who knows, perhaps in the future for CPC. So Martha, I'm, I'm sure you're glad that has been resolved uh, and that uh, amicably, I hope, and that all parties are moving forward um, with that. And it'll be interesting to see how, what form the old church takes there, sort of an icon in Northampton. So. That's a that's an in, interesting issue. Um, so we have an uh, interesting round in front of us. We have nine projects coming in at uh, well over three and a half million um, dollars. Uh, we have in front of us a little over seven hundred thousand dollars to spend. So applicants, as you hear this. Uh, know that there is really stiff competition, that there are some very large projects, a couple large projects in front of us. In fact, I believe the largest project that I've seen in my tenure, um, which is rehabilitation of Memorial Hall, restoration, I should say, of Memorial Hall in uh, uh, next to City Hall in Northampton, coming in at almost $2.8 million, $2.7 million something. So um, Sarah's going to give us the financials. And as she goes through that, if folks will remember, we have $770,000 at our disposal. Uh, but we also have the ability to bond. And the bonding means we're borrowing. We're not borrowing from the general city coffers. We're borrowing from future CBC uh, revenues. Um, the only project that is that we are able to bond is Memorial Hall. Sarah thinks that perhaps the playground, 
at uh, Ryan Road Elementary could be bonded, but that's much more challenging. Um, so sort of the, the clear bonding opportunity, if we would choose to do that, would be Memorial Hall. Um, if we were to bond, that money would not come out of this uh, this round's expenditure. We wouldn't bond and wouldn't be available until next round. So that's something that helps, uh, Sarah can help us with as well. Chris Tate. I'm just curious, the projects that we didn't fund last round, are those still on the docket for funding or only the ones that were presented to us this round? Only the ones that were presented to us this round. So, so some of those had, projects didn't choose to seek funding again. Uh, it, it, it looks to me, Chris, that uh, the only one that did so is uh, Historic Northampton and those two projects that they have set forth. Otherwise, the two big city projects have not come forward. In fact, they've come up with yet with another one. So um, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, you want to run us through the financials? Yeah. So, I mean, that's really the gist of it. Um, so we're we're dealing with the end of fiscal year 24 funds. Uh, we'll receive additional funding at the start of the fiscal year 25 in January. And those were not a, in July. And those will be available for the, the fall funding round. So total of about 774,000 available for spending, uh, 169,000, almost 170,000 is within the historic reserve account. So that would only be available for uh, historic preservation projects if not spent. So if there's no funding allocated towards a historic project this round, that that would remain in that account, in that account until the next fiscal year. So I guess, unless anybody has any questions, that's really the, the rundown. Uh, questions for Sarah. Martha. Yes, I believe I asked this question in the fall, but um, just uh, if maybe to remind everyone, uh, the reasoning why the only project likely to be eligible for bonding is Memorial Hall. Sure. So there, there are state laws regarding um, borrowing and what cities and towns are able to borrow for. Capital improvements on city owned properties are available. Um, so the Memorial Hall project would be a clear one. I would have to talk to bond council about whether the, the playground project would be eligible for bonding. Um, it, it's based on the, the life cycle of a, the equipment being purchased. So it, it may be possible, um, but the Memorial Hall project definitely would be. And if that's something the committee is interested, I'll, I can pull that together for a future meeting. Jeff, uh, Jeff. <clears throat> thank you. Um, <clears throat> Sarah, just offhand, do you know what the largest uh, bonding project um, this committee has, has funded in the past? Me, quickly, uh, so just for bonded money. projects, not for, all, all projects specifically? No, just the bond, the bonding right. part of it. <clears throat> so that was... I thought, Sarah, I, I know I asked you this question yeah. when we were talking the other day. I thought it was both, if you combine Pulaski Park 1 and Pulaski Park 2, oh. we got in yes. the two point something million. And then if we looked at being an Allard farm, that was also a two point something million, but not quite as high as the 2.7 million. Yeah, and I, I do have that handy. Um, come back to it at the end of the meeting, Jeff, and I'll, I'll pull all the, the bonding together and share that. Sure, thank you. Chris, how? Uh, yeah, so um, just to follow up on something you said, Sarah, I at some point we are probably going to discuss bonding. So I, any information you can give us on that, okay. um, particularly the total amount of bonding that we can recommend, because I know it's not infinite. There's a there's a cap on it, and uh, whatever that number is, and 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 um, how how the cap is determined would be would be useful to know at some point. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Um. So just quickly, it's based on the amount of local revenue that's anticipated to come in. So although we're we're expected to still be receiving the state match, that's not guaranteed. So that's not something we're able to to bond for uh, against. Uh, but I, I'll pull the figures together for the next financial report. 
Uh, other questions for Sarah? Um, I, I have one, Sarah. Where are we in uh, satisfying our bond requirements? Are we getting, we're getting close to done, right? We are. So just based on, so this includes everything that we are still making payments on in June. So from this fiscal year, I mean, so not including this fiscal year. So starting with fiscal year 25, there are uh, 600,000 in payments left to be made for all projects. And that includes principal and interest. And that goes for how many years? Uh, final payment will be in June, 2027. 2027, great. Thank you, Sarah. Any other questions for Sarah? All right. So now it is our pleasure to hear from four of the nine, <clears throat> excuse me, applicants who have applied for this round for CPA funds. Um, and again, we'll start with uh, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, move on to the affordable housing monitoring project from the city, Lathrop's invasive plant control, and last, but certainly not least, Parsons and Shepherd Houses. Um, applicants know that we have read your proposals uh, and that, uh, are, and we're eager to hear what you have to say. We'll listen to your presentation and then we'll ask questions of you. There may be written questions as well that will come um, to you before deliberation. Also applicants, please know that, uh, let's see, I believe it's April 3rd, just about a month from now, the first Wednesday in uh, April will be the public comment session. So if you would like your constituents, your folks to make comments, uh, please get them out at seven o'clock on Wednesday, April the 3rd uh, for our time to hear everybody uh, speak their mind about, about these different projects. Um, we will most likely not get to deliberation about those projects on April the 3rd, instead probably be waiting till April 17th. You're invited to any and all CPC meetings um, but to hear our deliberations will probably be about April the 17th. City Council doesn't vote. We are the recommending body, reminder to you. We recommend City Council funds. City Council won't get to them till at the very least the end of April, if not sometime in May. Uh, um, so that's how it works. Uh, so let's go to it. Uh, first, Pioneer Valley Habitat for uh, humanity. I believe Megan is here to I speak am. to that. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Brian. Um, happy to uh, be able to talk about this project with all of you today. And um, we, um, I don't know if there's anyone new on the CPA committee, but I always start by uh, introducing ourselves. So Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity builds homes in Hampshire and Franklin counties with uh, community help from volunteers and the future homeowners themselves so that they put sweat equity into the construction and then purchase a home with an affordable mortgage when construction is complete. We're in the process of accepting applications right now for our project on Woodland Drive. And the application deadline is April 3rd. It sounded like a very familiar date when you were just mentioning it um, for the public comment session. So we have information on our website and I encourage you to share that information uh, widely. Uh, Woodland Drive is a street off of Route 66 that makes a sort of a U. Um, the land that we acquired for this project was uh, donated by the city of Northampton. Uh, there, our lot is one of two lots that was created in a wooded section along uh, that sort of initial arc of Woodland Drive. We're planning to build a two-story, three-bedroom, single-family home that's approximately 1,300 square feet. It's going to be energy efficient, built to Energy Star standards, all electric, and part of the meeting Tampton standards and goals for decarbonization. Um, we're planning solar panels on the roof. 
but we're still in the midst of tree, tree clearing. Smith Vocational Forestry has been started that process for us. Uh, this sort of simple salt box is a design that we have built in the city uh, before and are actually currently under construction on Burt's Pit Road. Uh, there will, we sometimes will make small tweaks from project to project, like uh, switching the orientation of the shed or which direction the house faces based on the site conditions. But it will be a slab on grade house, which is why we have a, um, a shed for the homeowners, for storage, for lawn mowers and things like that. Um, we've adjusted our roof line from a uh, peaked gable in the middle to have one of the roof, uh, sort of a adjusted gable so that we can have a larger surface area for solar. Um, the, there's been some changes to the fire code that require a bigger walking path around the roof, around the edge of the solar panels. So we can't fit as many panels on a roof as we used to be able to. The uh, house will be visitable by someone in a wheelchair. Um, the first floor half bath and the main living space can be accessed via a sloped walkway to the door between the shed and the house. And um, the first floor has the living room, dining room, kitchen, and that half bath with the laundry in it. The second floor then has three bedrooms and a full bathroom with a bathtub. Uh, in our proposal, you guys have already read um, our overall development budget. Um, we uh, have received $10,000 from a local foundation, and we're very grateful for that. Most of the other funding in here is preliminary. Um, we have put in an application to the Charles Bank Foundation, but have not yet, uh, they have not yet made a decision. Um, we, the home sale proceeds from the first mortgage is an averaged amount uh, because we uh, have an income range where we look for people somewhere between 30%, $30,000 a year as a minimum income and 60% of the area median income. If we end up with a family selected that's at the top of our income range, they might be able to afford a little bit more of a mortgage than someone at the bottom. So, that's just a sort of a quick introduction to the project and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Megan. Questions for Habitat? I will ask one then. Um, can you give us a status of the other projects that we have uh, help to at least partially fund, uh, I think, a number on Burt's Pit Road. And just can go over that, please. Sure. We have two projects on Burt's Pit Road. One we call Broughton's Meadow Homes, and that's in the 700s of Burt's Pit Road. Um, those three houses, the, we did a one-bedroom, two-bedroom, and three-bedroom. Those were all single-story homes, and those are completed, the homeowners moved in this fall just before Thanksgiving. And um, we are, are, they're in their first year of occupancy. We have another three home project um, uh, on Burt's Pit Road in the 200 range, closer to the dog park. And those three houses are currently under construction. We just insulated two of them and the third one is gonna be insulated in the next few weeks. Um, we're doing two two-story homes there and one one-story home. And Smith Vocational Carpentry has been taking the lead on the uh, construction of the one-story home, which has been a great help. We've also had the plumbing and electrical departments uh, working on that site. I'm happy to answer questions, but I don't know, Brian, are you calling on people or me? Was uh... I was muted there, of course. Um, David, usually we have uh, committee members ask questions, but if you have a quick one, please go ahead. 
Yeah, I'm a neighbor right next to the Woodland uh, Drive home, and I have two questions. Is the, the map you were showing of the location house pretty much what you think it's going to be? And also, do you have any anticipation for when construction might be starting to happen? I know that the Smith School's been there starting to do what they can do, and I guess Cotton's coming in after that, but if you can give any update on that. Yeah, we had, we have our, uh, already have zoning approval from the planning board. So the site plan is fairly well set. Um, that we made some minor adjustments um, to actually just to give the, like couple of the trees that we're saving a little more room around the roots. We shifted the driveway over a couple of feet. Um, but uh, we did those in consultation with Carolyn Mish but there hasn't been any significant changes to the site plan since it was approved by the planning board. Um, we hope to start construction this spring. Um, I'm gonna, I sent, dropped off the driveway permit to the DPW this week, and uh, we'll be in the permitting process over the coming weeks to uh, be able to start construction this spring. Kevin. Uh, yes, yeah, something I've always wondered about uh, habitat houses. You talk about being affordable in perpetuity. What are the constraints on selling the house subsequent uh, to its occupancy? Yeah, great question. So we put a deed restriction on the home that limits the resale value. And there's a formula in the deed restriction that calculates what the maximum resale value can be and it's benchmarked to the median income in the area. So the resale price will be at least what the buyer purchased the home for. So if we sell it for uh, 190,000, they'll be able to resell it for at least that. But if incomes in the area go up and um, uh, it would be, a f then the sale price, the maximum sale price might go up because this is into the future, you know, 20 years from now might be when someone's selling. So they don't get market appreciation in on the value of the house, but they do get equity every time they make a mortgage payment. And there is some mechanism for the home price to go up over time, but just pegged to incomes rather than market values. Very good, thank you. Any other questions for Megan? Okay, Megan, thank you very much. And uh, we, and again, April 3rd is that date, not just to get applicants for the houses, but also to hear from folks interested in speaking on behalf of Habitat for Human. All right, moving right along. Uh, let's see, Sarah, I don't know who we have for the affordable housing monitoring project from planning and sustainability. Oh, that, that is housing planner Keith Benoit. Great. Welcome, Keith, and thank you for coming to see you. Thank you. Um, so um, kind of related to, um, you asked about the restriction on the house. So um, uh, the city was named as the monitoring agent for six homes on um, Emerson Way. Um, so um, that's not something we normally do. Um, and the monitoring agent, uh, it's named in the deed writer, and basically there's some, um, some well, monitoring, but there's some activities that need to happen kind of throughout the house, uh, the life of the, of the house. Um, and so if they want to make improvements to the house or um, they want to sell the house, those are things that the monitoring agent needs to oversee. And it's particularly important when um, the homeowner is selling because we need to find another eligible buyer. Otherwise, that a house, if an eligible buyer um, cannot be found within a certain amount of time, um, then that house can go up, can uh, can lose its restriction. Uh, and so it's a very important activity to maintain uh, the houses we have. These are 90, there are six units that all have 99 year leases. And this is um, activities that the city 
um, doesn't really do. Uh, we don't have um, uh, like as much experience as someone else doing it um, who does this all the time. And so uh, Valley Community Development, uh, they do some of this with some of their units. Um, they do um, lotteries. Um, that's another important thing is having a lottery that there's all the fair housing practices and things like that. So they do some of that with um, the lotteries with their all their bigger projects, but some of their they do have some small home ownership units. They've done this uh, resale, and so the activity. I'm my request is for six thousand dollars, and Valley says that they can do the monitoring of these six houses um, uh, for three years. Um, so it works out to like three hundred thirty-three dollars per unit per year. Um, that includes um, every year they would be um, sending letters or following the home, homeowner, making sure they're still there, um, and then doing any other things like uh, if they request capital improvements and then uh, 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 doing any type of resale and any fair like um, uh, lottery. Um, so that's that's the gist of it. Um, Thank you, Keith. Uh, questions for Keith? Uh, Chris, uh, <clears throat> Chris Helm. Uh, thanks, um, Keith. Thank you for being here. So. Um, you said this is something that we the city doesn't normally do. So why now? Um, and I, you know, I recognize that six thousand is a very modest amount of money, particularly when you prorate it over units and time. Um, but it, it's it's it seems to me like operations money, and um, generally that's not something we do. Um, so and I and I'm certainly, um, you know, I can I can see why we want to we want to continue to support these houses um, um, over their life. But um, I'm also concerned about anything that looks like a down payment on a long-term commitment to this type of activity, so. Sure. Uh, so for why right now, um, I was notified from a homeowner uh, who lives at one of these units that they want to do capital improvements to their home. And that then I went to the deed and once the initial sale happened um, a couple of years ago, the city is the name monitoring agent. And there's, you know, 40, 50 times where there's an activity in the deed writer that, that the city now has to do. So that's where I was notified. Um, I don't know why the deed writer was written like that. I certainly would not volunteer the city to do this because it's kind of outside of our expertise. Um, certainly we know how to, about 40B and things like that. But I think uh, the concern for me is kind of the, the fair housing and the, um, you know, I think also the separation of um, funding affordable housing, but then also being the monitoring agent. Um, so I think there, um, I don't know why it's written like that. Um, but to your point about operations, I can definitely see that um, but um, if the my my reading of the deed writer is that um, there's I think it's either thirty or sixty days or something like that of not finding an eligible buy buyer, then that could go to a market rate buyer. And so, um, you know, these are um, home owner, home ownership opportunities that could be lost um, to affordability if if we didn't do it correctly. And uh, Keith, there are certain state programs that require uh, monitoring agents. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So, uh, um, well, in in this one, um, they specifically mention uh, Chapter Forty B and um, I believe it's Seven Sixty CMR, something like that, um, uh, and Mass Housing. Um, Other Megan? Uh Jeff. Oh, excuse me. 
Did you call on me? I did. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> from what you just said, Keith, is it so it sounds like the city did not know this existed until the homeowner reached out to the city and, uh, for home improvements. Is that right? I didn't know, uh, but I don't know where other people were in the mix um, <clears throat> on it. Um, I <clears throat> I don't see a city signature on the deed writer. Um, so I don't know where that conversation was when when this was happening. Okay. Um, so does this also mean that uh, were we to approve this, like Chris said, it's a modest amount, that in three years the city is going to come back to this committee for another renewal? And this is just going to go on indefinitely? Uh, yes, that, I mean, that is a potential because the deed writer goes for 99 years. Um, yes, but there could be uh, a way we could, um, look for other funding sources as well. Are there any other homes in Northampton, you know, of that are subject to this? Uh, I mean, I have a list. There's a lot of houses and, um, the deed ride, the deeds are very long and, I haven't had a moment to look at them, but uh, from the from the six that I have here, and there's two, a few others um, that I looked at briefly that uh, I thought they might have that, but I did not see any other language uh, from that set of houses. Um, but there could be, yes. Okay, I just, without knowing more, I, I just reserve judgment, but I just find this whole thing a little um, suspicious, and I know there were some questions raised about Emerson Way in the past, and I, I live close by, and I remember getting neighborhood mailings about certain things, and I also think the original layout that we had at the Burt's Pit Road um, was not for the number of houses that it turned out to be, and I think Emerson Way was involved in that somehow. I don't know. I'm speculating. But thank you. Uh, Megan, are you able to cast some light on this? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I have not read the Emerson Way uh, deed restrictions, but I did wonder if they were part of uh, the local initiative program or Chapter 40B, because it is standard practice to list the city as one of the monitoring agents. So um, I know on all of Habitat's deed writers, we list the state, the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is now Executive Office of Living, the city, and Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity collectively as the monitoring agents. And um, that usually uh, there is also a fee in the deed that's possible for the transfer that funds the monitoring agent doing the marketing. Um, so the capital improvements uh, is something that doesn't come up too often, but they could also, if the, I'm wondering if anyone else is listed as a monitoring agent alongside the city. I didn't see anyone. Um, I can definitely do a deeper dive, but um my my reading of it is it was transferred to the city. Lemmy? Yeah, um, my question was mainly like what other like properties does Valley CDC do this monitoring agent is works in this capacity and like, you know, what's their sort of track record for that or like generally how often do they do this? Which places are they doing this for? Um, I think they had uh, two or three other units that they did this for. They generally don't have single family home ownership units. Um, they definitely do much bigger projects, you know, 20 units. That's kind of like the sweet spot. Um, but all those have um, uh lottery and uh, fair marketing uh, and all um, those things that uh, are important when we're trying to get uh, qualified 
buyer or renter into the into the building. Thank but you. um uh, Valley, they they've done our first time home buyers, they've done uh micro enterprise. Um so operationally, you know, uh, we've worked with them in the past and we're pretty confident that they can they can do this. Sarah, do you have any comments on this? Uh, I was just going to add what, what Megan had already said, that these are required for local incentive program units. Um, and for some reason, and I, I don't know all the details on this one, that only the city is listed as the monitoring agent, and the city has the right to assign that to someone else. And there are provisions to for the monitoring agent to be paid upon sale, but these are all fairly new units, so uh, that would be a long ways down the road. Thanks, Sarah. Any other questions from committee members on the affordable housing monitoring project? Martha? Yeah, thank you. Um, Keith, if um, the CPC were to decide to not fund this what would the city do about the task um well i'd look to see if there's another funding source uh well it to possibly pay for an outside entity like valley um they're willing to do it um we have a good relationship with them um if money can't be then you know that would fall to me uh, most likely um and uh you know so far i've only had capital improvement um uh requests but you know i have like a uh, monitor agent you know qualifications and duties and there's a um there's definitely a lack of kind of knowledge within the office on some of these things so um you know, we help um, fund um, houses that have these two restrictions and we're there to kind of facilitate and things like that. Um, but um, like things like the resale um, and the uh, lottery, things like that, um, we just have to um, get some more training. I know Mass Housing Partnership and Mass Housing, they do have training like that. Um, but so far, I've not um, utilized those because that's not been something that our office had to do. So um, we would look at other ways to make sure that we have knowledge. And, um, you know, um, part of our office is to monitor the subsidized housing inventory and when things are coming up to try to, main, one, make sure the state has um our list and it's accurate. And then as things come up, uh, if they are going to expire to see if we can't get them to um, to, main, to continue. So it sounds like there may be other sources of funding for this that I'm assuming have been unexplored at this point. Um, and then my other question is because how do other communities handle this? I'm sure that there are other communities that have and have you looked into that at all? I've not seen other, I'm sure there are other communities. Uh, I think that's where I kind of got this um, monitoring agent qualifications uh, list, um, but um, I've not uh, talked to them about it, no. Keith, might it be fair to say that for these particular units, this requirement which is standard in the state deed writer was a little bit of a surprise, but that uh, this duty would be factored into the planning for future units that have the same requirements. Definitely a surprise. Um, I mean, I've never seen it. And it, I think everyone in the office was kind of taken aback by it um, because we were unaware up until we kind of got this. Um, but yeah, I would not, want this i mean we we have our specialty and it's not like i don't like work this is not our specialty uh and there are people that kind of do it um so yeah i think in the future we would not want to do this um going forward Ms. Tate? 
sounds like maybe there's there's more research, Keith, to be done internally with who approved this deed writer in the city in the first place. And I guess my question is, since this seems unusual and doesn't seem like it's been done for other projects that we know of, is there a chance to amend this deed writer? I mean, did someone pull a fast one over on the city? I just don't quite understand how the city got itself into this situation for one. And two, um, you know, understanding how not to get ourselves in this situation for future projects, um, especially because this committee approves a lot of uh, affordable housing projects. So we certainly don't want to, we don't want this to be the first of many instances of this situation. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I concur. There's some research I need to do to kind of clarify some questions here and get back to specifics of operationally how this would work out. Either A, if we move forward, or B, if we don't, and I need to look for something else. Whether or not there's some sort of chicanery happening, I don't really know. The The history of um, Emerson Way is complicated. Um, and I mean, just... I know, you know, Megan has some homes that are right there and just getting the home numbers and the lot numbers square straight is confusing. Um, so um, I don't know why we were named them as the monitoring agent. Um, but yeah, um, please, if you see it come through, don't approve it. <laughs> Other questions for Keith? So it seems to me, Keith, that since the committee has maybe you could do a little bit more digging on uh, some of these issues that we brought up and uh, get back to Sarah or get back to us with, the, with those findings. Um, and if need be, you could comment uh, in a, a month from now in that, in that public comment, come back and share some of that stuff with us. But we would appreciate any and all information that you can give us. Um, Will do. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. All right, moving right along <clears throat> to makeup community and the invasive plant control yes. project. Yes, I'm here. I'm Barbara Walvard. I'm a resident at Lathrop. I am on the steering committee of the Land Conservation Committee, which is a resident committee which works closely with management. Our CEO, Patrick Arguin, had a conflict for tonight, but he is very aware of this project and working with us on it. There are three members of our uh, resident steering committee here, Jane Antonson and Ann Litke and Ruth Alken, in addition to me. So what I'm gonna try to do about this quite long pro proposal is to guide you through four points about it. And I will be referring to page numbers in the proposal, but I'm not going to take the time to flip through the whole thing. It's long, but you can understand it if you see it in kind of four pieces. So first piece, what is this project and what are its goals? It is a collaborative project between Northampton and East Hampton CPC committees and uh, Kestrel and Lathrop, each contributing part towards the goal which is to bring 103 acres total on both Lathrop campuses of CR land up to a pretty high level of control of invasive plants. That's the main goal. In addition to that, we will work on about seven other acres that are not CR, but that will be funded by Lathrop and Kestrel, not by the city. So the city's funds will only be used for CR land. There are some other smaller goals. One is to replace some of the invasive plants in the campus landscaping with native plants so that those invasives don't become great <laughs> um, seed banks for the adjacent CR land. And that again will be paid by Lathrop funds. And then to run a couple of public programs and put on signs on the land and a website. So that's my first goal. What is the goal? What is this project? And what is the goal? 
Second, this is valuable land. And on pages nine and 10 of the proposal, we talk about how valuable it is, both ecologically, because it has been designated in a couple of different ways as, as having ecological integrity and so on, and it lies adjacent to core habitat. The Northampton portion of this, of this project, the CR, is about 14 acres. It is adjacent, it abuts the Fitzgerald Lake. On the East Campus on Florence Road, the Northampton portion, which lies within the city of Northampton, is 11.2 acres, and it abuts on the north and the west, it abuts other protected lands in the Park Hill area, and on the south, it abuts 78 acres of CR in East Hampton, held by the Kestrel Foundation. So this is a budding land, wild land, undeveloped land that provides wildlife corridors and that has significant ecological value, among which are two streams that run down into the Manhattan and the Connecticut. That's my second point. This is valuable land. And it is valuable to the community, not just for a kind of um, reserve or, or um, say, <laughs> protected place for wildlife in what is otherwise a pretty invaded landscape, urban landscape, but it is also valued because these lands are open to and are used by the public. My third point, what's the basis? What's the background here? Well, this land has been worked on and you know that because small grants from you over four or five years have helped to do some of this work and it shows. On the North Campus, there are 11 acres out of the CR that are so pristine that the people who did the study of this of the invasives in this land could find less than 1% invasive plants in these acres. These acres are surrounded by Fitzgerald Lake, which you know is not that pristine. So that's our work. That's the work that you funded, that we've funded, and that volunteer residents have spent hundreds of hours working on. That's a real achievement. The other lands have been worked on to various degrees. Sometimes we didn't have the money to follow up. And they are a patchwork of different levels of control of invasives. And those, and those maps, so the maps that are included in the study that is attached to our proposal will show you where those invasives were found to be more or less dense. So this land has been worked on and there has been considerable progress. We have something to show here. And what the research indicates is that a land which is dominated by invasive plants may lose up to 90% of its wildlife. We are protecting our land from, from that. This land has been evaluated as the basis for this proposal. So Land Stewardship Inc did a study of our land and the invasives on it of the East Campus, including the Northampton portion of the East Campus in fall of 2022 and on the North Campus in spring of 2023. And that evaluation contains a list of the invasives that were found, maps of how dense they are, priority ratings of what they think we should attack first, and by the way, all of the Northampton CR land on both campuses is rated by them as the top priority. That's red in that map that you saw in there. And, um, and also uh, estimated costs and a timeline. So this was a very thorough study, which we paid for at Lathrop with resident funds that we raise every year for this work on our land. So we're going to be moving forward now to carry out this plan. And that's what we're asking you to help us fund. So my fourth point is, what's the budget and what's the timeline? So the budget calls for $97,000 from the city of East Hampton, $19,131 from you, and both money and in-kind services from Lathrop 
and from Castro. When we put this all together, we will move forward. The timeline that's in the proposal has the project starting in 2024 and going for three years. But because there have been delays uh, in, on, in East Hampton um, and on our own part, because we were in the process of hiring a new CEO and the board didn't, uh, couldn't get to this right away and so on. So um, we're going to be able to get a little bit done in 2024, but the majority of the project will start in 2025. I have two contractors who are intending to submit bids for this work. Both of them are filling up their schedule for 2024 right now, but we won't know whether we have the money until their schedule is pretty full. But both of them have said, look, we'll fit you in the best we can once you have the money, and then we'll really start in 2025 and we'll submit a bid on that basis. So it, where you see 2024, think, okay, a little bit in 24, most of it in 2025. Those are my four points. Any questions? <clears throat> questions for, I'm sorry, forgive me. What? Tell me your first name again. Barbara. Barbara, thank you. Martha. Thank you, Barbara. Um, that was a great presentation and also I very much enjoyed reading your proposal. I just had a couple of questions. Um, the funding that you're receiving from East Hampton, has that been committed? That has been discussed, but not committed because they ran out of money. <laughs> okay. We came, to, we came to them and they said, oh, this is a worthy proposal, but we don't have the money. So they heard it once. In May, they will hear it a second time and then they will decide whether to fund it or not. And then um, we'll have the funding in, I guess, in late summer. So what happens if that funding doesn't come through? Then we have to go back to the drawing board, come back to you and say, okay, here's our revised project or, you know, whatever. Yep. You're right. We're balancing <laughs> these various sources of funding. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then second of all, um, can you talk a little bit about the long-term control of the invasives? No, um, mm -hmm. you've done, it sounds like you've done an incredible job and um, I'm sure we all can speak for everyone. You appreciate, we appreciate that so much. The effort is, is really admirable. Um, but you know, what happens in 10 years when um, the mm -hmm. Lathrop community is not so interested in invasive species control and the birds come in and, you know, deposit their, you know. <laughs> yes. The Lathrop community will still be here in 10 years. We have an ongoing committee, which is very large, very strong. We have as part of our strategic plan at Lathrop, environmental stewardship, which includes stewardship of the land. I would expect that in 10 years, there will be even stronger interest at Lathrop in protecting our precious land of which we know the value. But the control of invasives is a difficult, difficult thing. Yeah. What you're trying to do is achieve a level of control that then requires monitoring and, um, you know, oops, here's another little one coming up. So let's get it before it grows. That's the kind of thing that you're aiming for. And that is what we're aiming for. We're mm -hmm. aiming for a consistent level of control across these acres so that then a minimum of monitoring and, and, um, follow-up is necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris Hellman. Uh, thanks. Um, thank you, Barbara. Um, I was actually going to ask Martha's question about the East Hampton funding. So um, since they're on the, on the, potentially on the hook for the lion's share, um, please keep us posted. But as, as you point out, it has been our pleasure to support your work on this in the past and 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 we do appreciate it so so please uh keep us up to date on on absolutely your progress with the proposal thanks yep, you'll be the first to know <laughs> excellent thank you kevin uh, yes i wonder if uh the funding if you have to get 100 percent of the funding in order to proceed or whether no. the the parts that are in northampton 
could proceed with partial funding if we were to decide to fund it. They could. Thank you. And by the way, I'll, I'll echo that the the Lathrop folks are some of the conservation committee's favorite people. That every time they come before <laughs> us, it's both Thank an you. enjoyable meeting and we learn things, and we have people who are dedicated volunteers. So they're really a terrific group to work with, as you Thank you. know from your your involvement. Let me say though that partial funding carries a cost because then we are only able to to maintain control of invasives in portions of the land. And the portions where we've already worked, but the invasives are coming back and things are slipping down. Now those become the repository, a huge seed bank for the adjacent <laughs> land, you know? So that's what we're trying to do with this whole three-year project is to say, okay, instead of pot shotting and running out of money and having this parcel almost free of invasives and this parcel next to it, quite heavily invaded, let's try to get a level of control that will allow us to keep much of that land from being invaded again so heavily. Barbara, I have a question for you. I know there's been a lot of controversy over the use of Roundup as an herbicide. Uh, I've seen your proposal that rodeo, sort of the wetland equivalent of Roundup is is to be used. Roundup wasn't mentioned, but I think a very similar um, herbicide is to be used uh, or is projected to be used as, as well. So my yes. question is, um, given the controversy over, over the use of herbicides, um, your thoughts on that and what your, your, are your contractors doing due diligence to look at Alternatives. I know Roundup works. It works well, but there is the carcinogenic issue that has surfaced uh, and is of concern to, to 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 folks. Yeah, there's no perfect solution to invasives. There are two ways to kill invasive plants. One is to go in there and cut them every two weeks for the whole growing season, over and over and over. We can't afford to do that for acres and acres and acres. And so we either let them take over or we make the best and most judicious use of herbicide that we can. And our contractors are, as you know, Land Stewardship Inc., which is Chris Politan's outfit. They've been in business for a long time. They are very knowledgeable. They use the best, they use the best science that there is behind this. And it's not like they go in and spray everything in sight with this big piece of machinery. No, they go in with a backpack and a wand and the wand has a, a, a cone on the end of it. And these plants are treated one by one, one by one. They're sprayed with this cone or if they're big enough, that's for the little ones. The big ones are treated by cut stump where the, you cut the, the, the bottom of the shrub or the vine and you use a little sponge tool to just dab the herbicide on the cut stump and it makes no spray, no nothing around it. It just makes its way down into the root of the plant and interferes with its metabolism. That's the mechanism by which cut stump uh, works. So. We are being as judicious and as precise as we possibly can. We have had a beautiful trillium growing right next to a treated plant. It was unaffected. And just to follow up, Barbara, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, herbicides cannot be applied by anyone other than licensed herbicide applicators. So it's not going to be the Lathrop volunteers who are doing the herbicide, herbiciding, is that a word? Um, but it right. will be the, the, the contractor. And that's where the bulk of, of the money we, requested we, goes to the contractor. Operate, yeah, we operate entirely within the law. And that's our contractors have, have the appropriate certification. Yeah. Great. Good to know. Any other questions for Barbara on the Lathrop project? Good to go. 
All right, thank you, Barbara. Thank you for your work. And um, and again, uh, anyone who wants to speak a month from now on April the 3rd, just about a month from now, four weeks, um, we will have the public comment uh, session. You're invited to bring Lathrop folks out for that. All right, thank uh, you. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on, Barbara, don't leave us. Oh, Nami, oh, I'm oh. sorry, I did not see your hand up there. I guess I just really quickly, like who, I know Lathrop is like an old, older community, but like, who has access to live there, who gets to access this land, just like a quick and dirty like overview of like access to the then protected land, you know, the land. That yes, you yes. The the Northampton CRs are all by, by deed um, open to the public. And we regularly see members of the public walking on our land. Does that answer your question, Lem? Yeah. And I could just add that uh, I'm, I'm more familiar with the uh, land that's adjacent, the north land that's adjacent to Fitzgerald Lake area. And uh, Lathrop does a wonderful job of maintaining pathways within that land that intersect with the lands within Fitzgerald. Yes, we do. We fund the... Uh, the I think, I yeah, think we have fund know where the line is between Fitzgerald Lake and the Lathrop line. Mm -hmm. If you walk along Foggy Bottom Road and you look for the sign that says Lathrop Land, um, you will see that there is a crushed, uh, a dirt path and then pretty soon a crushed stone path and a couple of bridges that go across wet spots or little creeks. Um, and Lathrop has, has maintained, has built and maintained those paths. The, the, one of the things that concerns me, Barbara, is um, the in, invasives do not see a difference between Lathrop and Fitzgerald Lake. And you <laughs> mentioned before that uh, yeah. Fitzgerald Lake being the crown jewel, perhaps, of Northampton Conservation property is also rife with invasives. And it's just so hard to control them. Um, and there's going to be this, you know, they're, they're going to jump boundary in a second. As soon as you walk away they're coming in and that this is uh it's an ongoing struggle for the rest of eternity it seems like keeping yeah the base, yep uh, yep true enough and i know that the fitzgerald lake people the broad brook coalition with with whom we work closely and many of as you know many of our lathrop residents are um, loyal uh, members and volunteers of the Broadbrook Coalition, and they work on invasives. They work on invasives, and so do we. So in this connected land, all of us are doing our very best in a hard situation. Thank you. It's, it's a really big area, but the city does target invasive removal where it makes sense to do that as well. I mean, mm -hmm. if a, a big knotweed stand or something that's been infested for years and years is a little bit more challenging, but you know, the, these marginal areas where Broadbrook Coalition and Lathrop have already done so much good work, we, we definitely try and keep them on top of as much as possible. Yep, yep. And Barbara, I know you had you had some good fun field days with, with Tom and, and Nisi. <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, we have. Any other questions for Barbara? Great, thank you for your time. And thank, thank you. you for your good work. Uh, last but not least, it looks like we have both perhaps Betty and Lori here to talk about the Parsons and Shepherd House proposals from historic Northampton. Uh, Hi. Here we go, Betty. I'm, I'm gonna start Welcome. off. Oh, there's Lori and, um, as well. This is Betty and Lori's gonna jump in too. So um, Sarah has some slides for us. Thank you. Um, just as a summary, uh, you saw this proposal last time and it's only slightly altered, but here it is again. It's a study of the uh, Parsons House, a historic structures report, and then a preliminary um, assessment, which is a step before a historic structures report for the Shepherd House, which is next door. So next slide, please. So a thing to note about this house is that it is on its original site. 
All three of our houses are on their original site, so they have not been moved. That's very important. This particular one is built in 1719. We desperately want to open it to the public, and it's just not in the shape to do that. It's been closed to the public since 2007. And um, the architectural historian reminded me the other day that when it's open, it'll be the only 18th century house in Northampton open to the public. So uh, next slide. We do know a good bit about the house already. There was a historic structures report done in 1992 and some really very good um, drawings so that you can really get the sense of it. So. Uh, the original core is this, and it is intact. Uh, it's been added to, but um, we know that this is what it originally looked like. And if you go to the next site, the next slide, huh? um, it was added on to over time um, and adapted. One of the main things, if you look at the core, again, the windows have changed, the door has changed and all. But also the roof has changed because there's been a lean-to that's added to the back of it. So that was a kitchen and two other rooms. The kitchen is, is still there. And these other little appendages um, have sort of uh, come and gone. The one in the back isn't doesn't look like that any longer. But here's the point that very early on, by the end of the 17th, by the end of the 18th century, they're starting to make changes in it. And we can look at the evidence of those changes. Next slide. Um, the, uh, uh, in the earlier uh, report, they pulled apart um, some of the walls and beams and such to take a close look at what was inside. Now, the reason to go over some of this again is that number one, things change over the 30 something, 40 years since this was done originally. And we're especially interested in the engineering study. You know, is it safe on the second and first floors for, for the public? Um, but also uh, methods of analysis have changed. So we want to do a better uh, dendrochronology study, another one, um, to look at where, uh, what all the components, uh, the wooden components are comprised of, and um, we can try to figure out where they came from. Um, next slide. So I look at the one in the center, or, or just the one with my finger pointing at the um, plaster and the lath covering the, um, the ship lap or the um, the clapboards on the back. So this is where it shows you that the a new room was added onto the back of the house, and so you can see the way the um, the original um, exterior of the house was constructed, and then the lath put on top of it. What's really interesting about the plaster is they had found out last time that it contained grass, it contained soil and other things. So we want to do a better analysis of where this stuff is coming from. This leads us to the big point, um, which is that in this study, we'd like to look at the ecology of the house. Where does it fit within the entire landscape of Northampton? in 1719 when it was um, first, when it was constructed. Um, what are all the plant and animal materials that they're pulling together and where are they coming from? Um, while we're doing the study of the house itself, we'll lead to other studies of our, of our, of our own. Lori is gonna look um, at the landscape so we can look at the landscape changes. Um, I'm going to lead a team and we're going to look more specifically at the uh, at the history of Northampton, some of the earliest documents that haven't been looked at in a long time. So we want to pull all this together because, I mean, some people say that, you know, a, a house embodies um, the, the land around it. But what can we learn about the land and the society by looking at all the build bits of the house? So that we hope will lead to a new kind of interpretation for it. I'm not kind of quite sure yet what that's going to be, but um, we're talking about doing some oh, conversations and seminars and public events and stuff to really talk, let the public in on understanding what the process is that we're going through to try to understand this house. So uh, wallpaper, paint, all of that, the rocks and all can be um, investigated. Go ahead, next slide. 
So uh, while we're having that team of experts with us, um, <clears throat> we thought it was a great chance to get them to take a preliminary look at Shepherd House next door. Um, we have had renters in there for a very, very long time. I think this is the first time in about 55 years it won't be occupied by somebody else because Mass Humanities, who's rented it um, from us for a number of years, is um, finding other quarters someplace else. So the house will be vacant. It's 1796, which means it's quite early, and it's never had a historic structures report. And, and before we decide what we're going to do with it and how, whether we need to restore, how we need to restore, you know, all of those kinds of questions, we do need this report. But let's get the experts to give a preliminary look so we can have some kind of an idea on what kind of a team we need to pull together uh, to do the study of that. And that'll be coming in the next, I guess, year or so. Next slide. So this is what the Shepherd House looks like. There's wonderful um, um, drawings by Thomas Shepherd on, on the actual architecture of the house, which is kind of interesting. You can see already that the windows have dry rot and they really need, they really need some attention. There may be some things we start to do right away. I don't know. Next slide. And that brings us to the budget and Lori's going to say a few words about that. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you, Betty. Uh, so when we submitted this application to you the, for these two projects last fall, the actual um, the amount that we were requesting at that time was fifty seven thousand six hundred and four dollars <clears throat> and um, or 50, 50, it's it's re reduction of uh, about a little more than twelve thousand dollars and what's changed since we last saw you is that we submitted an application to the Massachusetts Cultural Council, um, which it's the grant itself was for, for $25,000. Of that 25,000, 12,000, we assigned to this um, deep dive into the structure of the house, trying to answer all these questions that Betty just described to you. But the remaining $13,000 is for two other components that are not eligible for CPA funding. And that includes uh, an assessment for ADA compliance um, and how we can achieve that with the Parsons House. And the other component is pulling together a team to help us make this house more, not only more energy efficient, but carbon neutral. Just like the city of Northampton, one of our goals and commitments is to try to is to become completely carbon neutral by 2030, just in 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 alignment with the city. And um, but one of our challenges is that it those energy improvements have to be consistent with our underlying mission of. Uh, preservation. And so we had talked to the uh, Massachusetts Cultural Council in the past, and actually we gave a presentation about kind of this tension that cultural organizations like ours um, face when we're looking at energy efficient improvements and HVAC systems. And also for an organization like ours, you know, you can get a terrific HVAC proposal, but it's expensive. And is that really the right thing to do? And so we've pulled together a small team of consultants that would be funded through this uh, Massachusetts Cultural Council grant to help us. And they come on not only the energy efficiency side of the equation, but also um, individuals who are preservation consultants. So it's a terrific, it's a terrific team. And so those are the other parts of the 25,000. The other component is that we spoke at the Parsons Family Association's 100th anniversary this year and described the Parsons project to them. And several members, when we reached out last fall and told them about the project, they said that they wanted to support it. So um, those two pieces, $1,500 that we've already received privately from members of the Parsons family, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Council grant, which we are anticipating receiving, are the 
are the changes since we last saw you. So um, the total project cost for the Parsons assessment um, is $76,000 and we're requesting from CPA 44,000. And then the other, other project that Betty described, the preliminary assessment of the Shepherd House, that consists still of $3,000. So our request this time is for $47,104. So I think that's our that's our last uh, slide for this evening and we're happy to entertain any questions that you might have tonight. Thank you, Betty and Lori. And as always, thank you for your wonderful work. Uh, questions for Betty or Lori and or Lori. We have seen these proposals before, so perhaps that's why. And, and I, I will I just offer if um, uh, Betty met with uh, Myron statue last last week as a preliminary meeting, and she can describe kind of that, what happened then. But also, if any of you um, would like to come down and take a walk through the Parsons house or also Shepherd House, we, we'd be more than we'd be delighted to walk you through. Thank you for that offer, Lori. On our agenda is site visits and scheduling those site visits. So if folks feel the need to um, visit one or both of the houses, that's a kind offer and we uh, take you up on it if, if needed. Um, again, questions for Lori or Betty? Good to go on this. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, the two of you. And uh, again, uh, April the 3rd is when citizen, uh, sort of listening to the public commenting session. So bring your folks out for that. Uh, appreciate hearing from anyone who wants to speak on those proposals. Yeah. Thank you thank all you. so much. Thank, thank you. you. All right, we are moving through this. I think next uh, two weeks from now, perhaps we'll be um, with the five applicants, a more detailed analysis of some of those projects that we are perhaps less less familiar with. Um, next on the agenda is site visits. Uh, Lori and Betty just mentioned that both Parsons and Shepherd House would be open to folks if we would like to schedule a visit there. Um, Sarah, I'm sure we could get someone to walk us through Memorial Hall and take a look at that project. Um, other than that, I'm wondering if there's anywhere else we would want to go other than those two sites. Can anyone think of another one? Um, or is are, are those the two that make the most sense? And if folks wanted to hike the Lathrop site, particularly the North Campus, abutting Fitzgerald Lake. That's something, Sarah, you could take folks on if they were interested. Um, anybody want to weigh in on this? Would would maybe a quick show of hands interested in visiting Memorial Hall? Anybody there? Okay. Yeah, so we got a bunch of hands up for that, Sarah. Um, how about Parsons and Shepherd House. Anybody visiting those? Okay, Kevin's hand is up. Jeff's hand is up. So yeah, so a couple folks on that as well. Uh, I think a number of us have been there, but Sarah, if you could maybe work on that with trying to schedule. And I think mm -hmm. if, if if Sarah's setting up something doesn't work, Kevin and uh, Jeff, I know hands went up, can always schedule with Lori and Betty. They're more than happy to take anyone and everyone around any time, anywhere, um, around around those, those structures. Is, is there any other place that people feel the need to go um, other than those two? And maybe the third would be out with Sarah around uh, the North Campus at Lathrop. And I guess the East Hampton Campus as well, right? I mean, there is that it, it, access. Are there trails that go through the CR land coming out of the East Hampton Lathrop? There are, uh -huh. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. It's a cool spot so, if no one's been there. Yeah. But it is open and, to the public if you want to go at your leisure as well. Uh, let me, you had your hand up. Oh, I was sort of interested in 27 Crafts Ave, but then I looked at it and I realized it's not actually built. <laughs> so That's right. we can we can visit it, but there's not I've been much there to... on Bug Royale. I've like hung out, just took in a picture there or something. <laughs> yes, that's it. Uh, Martha. Yeah, for the uh, East Hampton Lathrop um, conservation area, is that easily found if we just go? Um. You have to access it from the East Hampton portion. So if you drive to the end of Bassett Brook Drive where the trailhead is, the main trailhead, now you're in East Hampton and you're gonna be on East Hampton trails. But if you follow the signs, you will be able to make your way. It's quite a hike and the trails are wet now, a bit muddy, um, but it's, it's quite a hike, but you can take that trail then up to the Northampton portion uh, of this of the CR, and it's a lovely it's a lovely walk along. It's it's not a I mean we maintain the trail ourselves. It's not a professionally main, maintained trail, but it is certainly a walkable and passable trail. Uh, it's a, just a packed dirt trail, and it leads along the brook there and um, out looking out over the marsh of Bassett Brook. Beaver have historically been there and now just reappearing this summer so I mean this spring so it's a lovely place and Barbara correct me if I'm wrong there there are places to park there at the trailhead the trailhead is very well marked as a trailhead there's a kiosk yes. it's, it's, all, yes. but, and 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 public parking is available we're not taking up Lathrop spaces there, correct there's a couple yeah it <laughs> there's a couple spaces to park I think three spaces to park there by the trailhead You'll see a little blue shed at the end of Bassett Brook Drive where it dead ends. There's a blue shed and there are three parking places there. Is there, a, that, trail, is there a map on the Lathrop Lands um, website? Do you know? Like a trail yes, map? there is. And, yep. Okay. There is. Great. And the um, our map is also part of the, on the North Campus, our map is also marked as a loop in the Fitzgerald mm -hmm. Lake uh, map. So, um, Sarah, it sounds like scheduling at least a um, visit for Memorial Hall for us. Okay. Um, uh, so, folks. for people who are interested in Memorial Hall, what what are the best general uh, days of the week and times? Folks, want to chime in on that? Uh, for me, days of the week, not that important but the earlier in the day the better okay well i was just about to say the later in the afternoon the better <laughs> and and you shouldn't use me as the as the bellwether on this so chris let's meet in the middle and i'm old and retired and I'm quite flexible. i have flexibility depending on the day okay so we should do it around chris and julia yeah flexibility as well okay I'm generally most busy on Wednesdays and Thursdays, but you don't have to schedule around me. Okay. All right. I'll so I will I will follow up on that one. Great. And you can follow up and yeah, figure that out. That's up to you. Thank you, Sarah, for that. Anything else on the site visits that we need to talk about? All right, every so often, is it every year, every two years, we elect a new chair or re-elect the old chair, we elect a new vice chair or re-elect the old vice chair. Um, currently, Chris Hellman is our vice chair. I am your chair. Uh, Sarah, I'll throw this to you as to how to how to run this rather than me doing it. Yeah, I mean, at, at the pleasure of the committee on, on how you'd like to handle this, um, this is something that not just with the CPC, but with lots of boards and committees that sort of falls by the wayside sometimes. We get, a, we get a chair that everybody's happy with and we just let it go a little too long. Uh, but the city clerk reminded 
every board and commission that this is supposed to be done once a year. So this is first meeting of 2024. So here we are. I nominate Brian and Chris to keep going because they're doing great. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. <laughs> You're stuck, Chris. Because I had notes that said, I'm more than happy to do it unless anybody else wants to step up. Julia Martha Jaff. I'm more than happy to do it unless anyone steps up, not steps up, is anyone is interested uh, as well. So uh, at any time, at any point, I am happy to step down. So just make sure people are aware of that. And Sarah, it just occurs to me that I think I was elected 12 or 14 years ago and I've never been reelected. Am I still chair of conservation? You were a couple of times. It, it wasn't quite really? that long, but this will be on the agenda for an upcoming council. All right. <laughs> Kevin, is there money with the conservation? Like, like I was just thinking with the invasive species thing, like, is it different? I'm just curious. I didn't hear them. You, were. you said you were chair of the conservation, right? Yeah. And so is there like, any funding that goes to the community from that commission, or is it just like, just related to the invasive species conversation? No. When we can find some grants, then there is, but on a regular, from the city basis, no. Interesting, cool. Just curious, thanks. Uh, Sarah, do you need to take us through so a roll call? No How does further discussion, uh, roll call vote, Julia? Yes. Yes. Chris Hellman? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Lemmy? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Chris Tate? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Brian? I almost want to vote no just to get a dissenting <laughs> vote in there, but, <laughs> but I'll, I'll keep it. It won't matter, a, Brian. It won't matter. I, <laughs> I'll keep it as a yes. And thank you. For Chris and myself, thank you for votes of confidence. Uh, other business not foreseen when the agenda was published. Uh, just to get back to the the bonding question, I thought I would easily be able to to tease out the amounts that not the full amounts that were funded, but the amounts that were bonded for these projects. And I I was not able to do that during the meeting, but I will follow up with a with that in a financial report along with additional bonding info. I, I do think we can safely say this is the most expensive project we've ever been asked. I'm talk, uh, talking about Memorial Hall and that if we were to bond it, it would be the, again, uh, obviously the the biggest bond that we would do. In, in one lump sum, absolutely. Yeah. All right, any other business? Uh, yeah, before uh, we... Me... Oh, go ahead. All right, let me... Oh, Chris, you can go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is I wanted to circle back to something that Chris Tate um, raised earlier, which was that uh, two of the proposals that we didn't fund in the last round, both of which came out of central services, are not on the agenda. And um, we're looking at a $2.7 million request um, also out of central services. Um, so cumulatively, we're talking about in this round alone, requests out of central services uh, totaling about $3.5 million. Um, we alluded to this a little bit on the first go round, which was, you know, the use of CPC funds to, to do historic preservation on municipal buildings. Um, clearly, this hasn't gone away. And um, it's something that causes me agita. So I guess it's just a, 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 a um, a note to my colleagues that um, I'm going to be looking at this, um, not just in the context of these particular grants, but how we're going to handle this moving forward, because these are big ticket items and they will quickly suck up any bonding capacity that we have. And uh, if we're going to do that, I'm going to need to be satisfied that, that, that it's finite and I want to know what finite means. So I'm going to want to hear more from the city about its long term plans on not just these structures, but any others on their campus that they're going to be looking to us for for funding. So that's just something I wanted to bring up. I, I guess Thank I would you. add Thank you, Chris. Uh, to that. 
I would add uh, my question, my version of that question is how would, what would a rational basis be for deciding what the city directly bonds um, or bonds only through our recommendation? Mm -hmm. I mean, and you're heading right where, you're, you're going right where I was heading, uh, Kevin, because I, you know, clearly it's going to, it's going to rapidly get to a point where it's well beyond our capacity to do this alone. And uh, so I think we're going to have to have a broader discussion about what that means. And it was interesting to see that the Memorial Hall, Hall request has 0% coming from other funding sources, 100% from us. Uh, right. Len? And that was true the last time too, with the other two proposals. Um, yeah. Um, I think this is sort of relevant to that conversation that like I'm sort of curious about like big picture conversations and like sort of longitudinal like strategic planning kind of stuff um like I know it, it seems like once we're done with applications we like stop meeting and I wonder about like having a meeting after we're done with applications to sort of talk about like big picture priorities or talking about priorities before we have like applications in front of us because I think yeah I'm just like a process question about like what we can do as a committee to like look to the year ahead and like be a little intentional um and something that came up for me this like in the last few months was i met with the lumberyard tenants association which is like the tenants that are working together and um they got cpa cpc funding in 2014 to build the lumberyard and there's like some you know whether there's structural issues with it or not is like seems to be contentious between you know all the players the tenants everybody but um you know it's an interesting longitudinal question of like in 2014 we it got cpa funds and i know there's another proposal up by some you know by valley cdc and just making sure that like for me i'm like i don't want to know how like are there going to be the same the same architects or whoever involved to prevent you know, this from happening again. So just some of these bigger picture things that I don't want to like necessarily jeopardize someone's individual application for a particular project, but just things that like, you know, we would, it would be nice to hear from past applicants of, C, you know, of CPA funding just to get community feedback, that kind of thing. Um, so those are just like big picture things on my mind. I know I'm like new here, but um, yeah. It's hard to think big picture when these applications are in front of us and like I don't want to jeopardize someone's individual application to have a larger conversation, you know. I think your your point, Lemmy, is a really good one. So we tend to be very uh, reactive that we get the proposals, we look at them sort of one and done, and then we move on to the next round without uh, looking back over what we've done always or into the future of what is out there. Uh, so perhaps we can <clears throat> carve out a, ta a, a time at the end of the rounds, maybe this this time, uh, where we can begin to explore how to look at that, as you call it, the, 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 the big picture. So thank you for bringing that us and please remind us to make sure that gets onto an agenda in the future. Ideally, this. We will also have an update of the CPC plan coming up this year. Um, you know, a lot of the sections are are in a, a good spot based on you know other long term plans and needs. Uh, but the historic preservation plan has, is in the process of being finalized, and there are some other updates that it needs. So that would be a good place to have those discussions. Yeah, nothing rushing. It's just like stuff that's been on my mind as I've entered the committee. Right. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, anything else? <sighs> All right. We have a wonderful rainy, rainy, rainy Wednesday evening. What else is new? Uh, two inches tonight. That's what I heard. Uh, so we'll see you downstream somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in Windsor Locks, or hopefully not. Um, and we will see you in definitely in two weeks, April, uh, March the uh, uh, 20th, One. correct? Wednesday the 20th. Thank you, everybody.